So good to be with you again, and I just want to take this time to invite all of you at this moment to join hearts together and really pray, seeking God's intervention in this crisis moment engulfing the whole world. I've prepared four specific prayer items and ask that you pause and pray for each of these items, believing that the Lord will hear us and answer our pleas. Ask God in his mercy to stop this pandemic and save lives, not only in our communities, but around the world, particularly in places where there are challenges uh, facing people medically to deal with this virus. Secondly, pray for President Cyril Ramaphosa and other government leaders that the Lord will give them wisdom to direct us in the best course of action for prevention and care. Thirdly, pray that the Lord will give us wisdom in this moment of fear as the foundation of what we know are shaken, that others who are lost would realize how fragile life is and how real eternity is, and that they would see their need to turn to God. And lastly, ask God to protect our missionaries and their families around the world, using the global pandemic to advance his good news to the lost world. Hey Church, it's so good to be with you this morning and I'm really excited to share this message with you today. So we're taking about 10 weeks to talk about all that the cross of Jesus has accomplished for us. And in the weeks leading up to Easter, we spent most of our time looking at how the death and resurrection of Jesus contributed towards our salvation, towards our being reconciled and restored back in relationship with God. And that culminated with the message on Easter Sunday about how the death of Jesus led to his ultimate triumph over evil and over the devil. Now, in the weeks following Easter, what we're doing is we're taking the same topic of the death of Jesus and extending it now into our ordinary, everyday lives and looking at how specifically, again, the death of Jesus radically impacts our ordinary lives. So last week, we kicked off that discussion by talking about how the death of Jesus really sets us up uh, to pursue and to accomplish a life of increasing transformation. How we have that dignity of transformation, of actually matching up to or catching up to or becoming who God has already declared us to be. So we started with that last week. Today, well, today we're going to cover just a lot of things, really. Uh, it's the whole host of, I would say, the greatest sources of our fears, anxieties, and insecurities. And we're going to see how the death of Jesus brings great calm and assurance to all of, honestly, the greatest sources of anxiety. So the things that keep us awake at night, the things that we find ourselves thinking about in the shower, our, our causes of our sadness and hurts. We're going to see how the cross of Jesus brings calm and assurance to all of those things. That sounds like a grand promise. Well, I can tell you that the passage we're going to look at today is big enough to address all of those things. Not long, but weighty enough. So we're looking at Romans chapter 8. Verses 31 to 39. So while you're grabbing your Bibles, I love what Pastor Ray Ortland said about this passage as he was about to read it. He said, these are the greatest words written in the history of mankind. And we have the privilege of reading them today. 
Romans 8, reading verse 31 to 39. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Romans 8 comes at a, at a critical place in you know, one of the most critical parts of of the Bible. So it's hard to say that because it's all critical, but any journey into understanding the gospel will always end up going through Romans. We spent some time there already. Uh, so it's a critical book. Romans 8 comes at a critical place in a critical book. And these verses that we've just read is the climax of that. So if you just look back through Romans 8, just look at some of the wonderful promises given that it opens up in verse 2 by talking about our freedom. It goes on to discuss this possibility of a life walking in the Spirit and the transformation and the newness of life that that brings. Uh, then it gets into talking about our adoption into the family of God, which includes this idea of our inheritance. Uh, verses 18 to 25. It's amazing, especially just for right now, where it talks about God's plan to ultimately restore all creation, literally the earth that is groaning, struggling under the weight of sin. I mean, that's what we're seeing right now. And it being restored through Jesus. And then verse 28 is that classic passage on God working all things for our good. And basically it ends this great chapter of promise, verse 31 to 39. It's this triumphant climax of all that God is going to do in this massive project of transformation for us and for the whole world. Now here's the problem. The problem that the passage we're looking at is specifically addressing is while all those promises are wonderful, the problem is, it just doesn't feel like those promises are coming true right now. It just doesn't seem like that's what's happening all around us. And this passage, verse 31 to 39, is meant to be a gospel explosion of assurance for us. And I'm quite convinced that that's what's going to happen. That's my prayer for this message today, that we're about to detonate through reading, through studying this passage, detonate a gospel explosion of assurance. And I know it's going to happen through what's discussed here, but just the way it's written, just want to marvel at this a little bit because it's written kind of like a poem. So there's this poetic beauty to this, almost like it was a song, sound like this victory song. 
verse 31 to 39. But then besides just the beauty and the poetry, there's also this insanely cool logic in this passage. Yeah, I just said <laughs> cool logic. In fact, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones called it logic on fire. You will not find a greater example in the whole Bible of logic on fire than verse 32. So I want to jump into verse 32 because I think it frames and sets up this entire, this gospel explosion of assurance amidst our greatest fears and insecurities and anxieties. It's going to all set up in verse 32. So listen out for the logic here. It says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So there's a kind of logical argumentation that is called a fortiori. So that's Latin, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that at all right, but it means from the stronger that's the kind of argument that Paul is using here. And it basically means something like this. It means that if the greater, harder, more difficult thing is true or has been done, well, then the lesser, easier thing must also be possible. Um, so, for example, if you, don't, if you do not feel that it is appropriate for your young child to ride a bicycle, like you just feel like they're not old enough, they're not responsible enough to operate a bicycle, then it stands to reason <laughs> that you also believe they will not be able to operate a car, right? That, that's a fortiori argument. And the converse is true. If you can trust or you believe your child is responsible enough to operate a car, well, then it stands to reason that you would believe that they could operate a bicycle. And that's the argument here Paul's using, and it's so simple. If God did the hardest thing of giving up his son for us all, then he will obviously also do the comparatively lesser thing of giving us everything we need, all things. If he's done the hardest things, if we reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ and see that's God's giving up his son for us all, then surely that means he will also graciously give us everything that we need. And that everything or all things is, is pretty big. Does that mean we can have anything that we want, health, wealth, and prosperity. Well, Paul, as we've read the passage, is going to go into a pretty dark discussion on the kinds of difficulties that a Christian faces. But this, it certainly does include all things. It does include this idea, at the least, of provision. And I wanted to mention that just especially now as we're worried about these things. And I know that because there's a similar argument made by Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 where he says this, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, but tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? It's the same kind of logical argument here. The argument here goes something like this. It is highly improbable that the Almighty God would waste his time clothing a field of flowers which will disappear in a day. Like it's improbable that God would pay attention to clothing flowers who would last for one day. But he does. Therefore, how much more will God clothe you who is of infinitely more value to him? If God would give up his son to rescue us from eternal suffering, how much more will he give us everything we need to relieve us from our temporary suffering? It certainly includes that. It's meant, this passage is meant to give us so much assurance 
relating to most of our fears, anxieties, and insecurities. So if you're still not really sure about this, not feeling too secure just yet, well, he's about to apply this to these three areas. These three areas of our life that we spend the most time worrying about. The three areas of this. We spend, tend to spend a lot of our time worrying under this lie of opposition, accusation, and isolation. And this passage is going to address those three lies that cause such distress. And it's going to address them by employing three rhetorical questions. Here's the first one. So, number one, one of the greatest lies that we believe that causes so much hurt is everyone is against me. Everyone's against me. It can feel like that sometimes, doesn't it? It just feels like the whole world is against me. Well, listen to this. If God is for us, then who can be against us? And let's not rush just past that, that first little bit too quickly. If God is for us, and it's a rhetorical question, so it, it, it can be written, since God is for us, he is for you, he's for me. God is not neutral towards us. His feelings are not neutral. And he's not kind of just waiting to see how we're going to perform, how we're going to do, and then decide whether he will be for us. No, God is for us. He's certainly not against us. And the argument here goes like this. If God is for you, if God is for you, then who can be against you? And I suppose we expect the answer to be, well, nobody. But the truth is, the answer is everybody. It seems like everybody's against me. I, I mean, my, my boss, my, my neighbor household, the world, every, well, actually everybody's against me. And, and in fact, Paul's going to talk later about persecution and the sword. The reality is there's lots of opposition against a Christian. It can feel like everybody is against us all the time. But the argument is saying this. If God is for us, if God is for us, then why waste even a particle of energy worrying about anyone else who might be against us? In other words, what could it possibly matter if everyone was against you but God was not? What could it matter if anyone else other than God were against you? If he's for you, why does it upset us so much when others are against us? It's insignificant if God is for you. Here's the second lie that we believe and that causes so much hurt and sadness. It's a lie that says, I am a horrible person. Everybody knows it. It's the lie of accusation. You ever thought that, you believe that? Horrible person and everybody knows it. Well, 
Listen to this, verse 33 to 34. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect, God's chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus, the one who died, more than that, is raised, he sits at the right hand of God and who indeed is interceding for us. So there's a lot of legal speech there. Charge, accuse, condemn. And the gospel answer is God justifies Jesus, advocates on our behalf. What that means in plain language is that if Jesus is advocating for you, right? So he's kind of your lawyer. He's presenting your case and God is your judge. Then he, and if he has acquitted you, then who can bring a charge against you? And that is what the term justified means. It means God has issued a declaration. I declare. Despite the evidence, you are righteous. And Jesus is advocating for that on your behalf. And if God declares that, who cares what anyone else says or thinks? It's kind of like this idea of the Supreme Court of Appeal. So that's kind of the highest court in South Africa. I mean, apart from the Constitutional Court, but kind of the High Court could refer a case to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And if the Supreme Court of Appeal issues a declaration that you are not guilty, free, then there's nothing anyone can do to further accuse you. I mean, they'll try, but nothing can stick. If God justifies you, who can condemn you or accuse you? So again, the answer, again, you would think, no one. But the truth is, everyone. Everyone's accusing me. I mean, for, I mean, for one, for starters, the devil accuses day and night. Others accuse, judge you, condemn, criticize. And you judge and condemn yourself. We do that all the time. We live under the weight of self-condemnation. Who's going to accuse us? Well, everybody. But if God has declared you righteous. And Jesus is advocating for you right now. And honestly, who cares what the devil or anyone else has to say or think? See, this one's just really hard for us because we obsess. Golly, we obsess so much about gaining other people's approval. It's like we're addicted to other people's approval. But the argument goes, if God approves of you, honestly, who else's approval do you need? And listen, it's not just sentiment. God's for you. He loves you. It's not just sentiment. He demonstrated it by he who gave his son. That's what it cost him to justify you. He takes this very seriously. Who are we to condemn ourselves? Or to care about what others or devil might be saying to us. Right, number three. Last but not least, one of the ultimate sources of fear, which creates great anxiety, is this lie 
that I am all alone. I'm isolated, separated, on my own. And particularly when fear is around, fear has a way of making us feel isolated. And it's, that's kind of, that's the moment that we're living in. <laughs> Besides the fact that we are like literally isolated, locked down. But fear just introduces this increased sense of isolation. I am all alone. How heavy does that weigh on a person, this feeling of being alone? Well, how about this thing? Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. And then verse 38, For I am sure, I'm convinced, says Paul, neither death nor life, angels, rulers, things in the present, or things in the future, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love to spend time reflecting on the love of God for us. This is one of the great passages where we just, we have to do this. I know I started off this series talking about it, but like, man, we can't. <laughs> we can't miss this. Do you realize that there was never a time that God started loving you? Have you thought about that? I came across that the other day. That's Jonathan Edwards, by the way. He always says things in mysterious ways. But think about that again. Do you realize that there was never a time when God started loving you? Because he has always loved you because he is love. And nothing is going to separate us from God or from His love. I mean, just look, look at these circumstances. Okay, these are bold statements. All things, nothing. But look at the circumstances Paul's describing. You know what's amazing about that list of things that cannot separate us? What's amazing is Paul has experienced every one of the things on that list. Except for the sword. Yet. Everything else, 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, is that exact same list. He's been through all of these things. He's saying, I've got to tell you guys, despite all of this happening, nothing will ever separate us from God's love. You know, sometimes Christians have these crazy ideas that when we become a Christian, because Jesus loves us, we'll never have any troubles. Truth? Yes, Jesus loves us. And yes, we will have many troubles. But those troubles will not separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And if you think about it, if we cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ. Is there really anything else in the universe to fear? I mean, it's just so hard for me to say this like to a camera. I just wonder how this is landing with you. And I want you to just try and pause and just think about this and just trust that the Holy Spirit's going to ignite that in us. If nothing, Nothing. COVID-19, economic recession, and worse. If nothing can separate us from the love of God, then really, what do we have to be afraid of? I mean, we're in this time of national distress. And let's be honest, our country's been through times of national distress before. But this is a new 
kind of national distress. So Paul goes on that strange little, seems like a detour, but he quotes Psalm 44 when he says, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. I mean, that was written in a time of great national distress for the nation of Israel. I mean, it was extremely dark times. I mean, the language here is that of, man, the whole world has become a slaughter house. That's how bad things are. And get this, Paul says, I see your Psalm 44, and I am absorbing it in Romans 8. Like I see, I get, acknowledging that, Psalm 44, I see that. And I am absorbing it. It is being swallowed up in this Romans chapter 8. I hope that this is bringing you some assurance. And that as you move out of church, home, and through the week, that this assurance will grow in your heart. In fact, I hope that it's given given you more than assurance. I hope that it's given you confidence. In fact, let's take that one step further. That that is, is giving you a sense of victory. So that's how this ends. Verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. Notice it does not say that through him who loves us, we will cope. It says that we will conquer. In fact, it says that we are more than conquerors. And the word there, I love the word there. Listen, it is literally the word. We are super conquerors. I know, right? That sounds like, you know, something out of a Marvel movie. But, you know, in life, they say that there are two kinds of people. There are winners and then there are losers. Truth There are losers, and there are those who appear to be winning. But then there are those who are the super winners, who are the super conquerors. Guys, that's us. That is those who are in Christ Jesus. Like, how's that going to affect you when you wake up in the morning and you're giving yourself your pep talk in the mirror and you've got the eye of the tiger playing there? (laughs) You know, if you're a man, the Rocky version, or if you're a woman, the Katy Perry version. Right? I mean, this is silly. Like, how's it going to affect you this when you wake up and you're, you're realizing, you're remembering? No. No. We are, I am, more than a conqueror through Him. Who loved me? Guys, we're going to pray. And what I want to do is actually just give you a moment. So give you in, in your homes. Maybe maybe you're still sitting in bed watching this. Or in your couch in the living room. Or around a table. I just want to give you a couple of minutes. So Michael will load, I presume, some some nice music just give you minutes to reflect on this just think through these three areas in fact do it now just close your eyes let's enter into prayer and I want to guide you but give you a chance to process this I'm really trusting and believing and hoping that God is going to ignite this assurance in our hearts so let's pray And as you're sitting gathered there in your homes, for some of you, this lie of opposition is so real right now. Everyone's against me. People around me right now are against me. The world is against me. My work. My circumstances.
If that's you, then just hear again, if God is for you, what does it matter who is against you? Some of you, some of us struggling under the weight of accusation. I'm going to guess for a lot of us it's internal. Self-condemnation. Some struggling with condemnation from others for no good reason. And for some, that's, that's the voice of the enemy that you hear constantly. God can't possibly love you. It is God who justifies. And He means it. He suffered and died on the cross to purchase it. That was for you, for me. And then those struggling with isolation. Meaning all of them separate, unloved perhaps, crushing emptiness, may God whisper these words to your heart, who can separate us from the love of God? Maybe you're just struggling with accepting this title of conqueror, never mind super conqueror, and you wake up feeling like a loser. It's how you feel right now. No, more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. God, I pray. And apply this truth, this assurance to our hearts as we see the truth that you gave your son for us. So how much more will you give us all these things? Praise you. We love you. We worship you. Glorify. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Hashtag Church at Home. It seems that this will be our way of church for the next while, even as the lockdown restrictions begin to lift. And so we would love for you to engage with us through Facebook or Instagram. This is a great way for you to keep up to date with all that is happening with RUC. Simply search for Rosebank Union Church on either platform. As we wrap up, don't forget the talk after the talk, or what we like to call couch talk. Today's questions are, number one, explain the logic used in verse 32 in your own words. Number two, what are the three dangerous lies we believe about ourselves covered in this passage? Number three, what does it mean to be more than conquerors in verse 37? For a more in-depth discussion guide from the sermon, please check out our website. Please also remember that you can continue to give to the work of RUC, either by SnapScan or by EFT, details of which you are seeing now. And finally, we want to leave you with this encouragement from the Word of God. To Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.